seven and the, the um, feast of unleavened bread, which was seven days uh, following upon the Passover meal. And we looked at some of these living reality of how that affects our lives right now and how the scripture declared that Christ is our Passover and um, uh, looked into the reality of, as it were, going through our homes, going through ourselves and making sure that there is no leaven uh, within us. And um, just want to read <coughs> a couple of New Testament scriptures because, again, we read, um, we read the New Testament, and we, if we don't have the foundation of the Old Testament and understanding that the New Testament is not just a new thing set up without any thought of the old, the New Testament is not just a brand new thing. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the old. And that has to be understood, that the New Testament, Jesus came and fulfilled the old, and the fulfilling of that is what is called the New Testament. And so that means that these, uh, so when the scripture says like here in Galatians 5, 9, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, that's not just a random thought, that's not just picking, uh, you know, that's not a baker's thought. That is an Old Testament reality that they had to deal with uh, leaven. And then also, uh, let's look at a couple other scriptures before I take off on this. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we looked at this scripture. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 5, and this is Paul talking to New Testament believers about fulfilling the feast. Fulfilling it. And this is uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse uh, 6. Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. And that was exactly what Israel was required to do for the feast of unleavened bread. <clears throat> but he's not talking to Jews here. He's talking to Christian Corinthians, which was not a Jewish city. And, uh, in fact, Paul's ministry was not primarily to Jews, but to Gentiles. And he's telling them to purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may have a new lump, as ye, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. He's saying to Gentiles, let's keep. But he's not saying, let's get a Passover lamb and let's have a meal. and let's. Uh, he's, he's, he's got all of this now on spiritual terms. And it is keeping the feast by getting rid of the leaven of the things that are in our life. And he goes on to describe some of those. Uh, Neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so for Paul, the feast is the, the literal Old Testament feast is fulfilled. But it is now fulfilled in us who are his body. And it is fulfilled in a spiritual way as instead of being Jews that go look through our house to see if there's a piece of bread that might have leaven in it, we go through our heart. We go through our lives to see if there are other things within us. And so we're keeping the feast now without going through rituals or whatever. We're living the living reality of that thing. And so... Uh, so turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. I want to give you a little bit different. I, I just felt that I needed to give you the whole picture in relationship to leaven. Though this one doesn't apply so much to the Passover, I just feel that if you didn't have the whole picture, you might, well, just frankly, it might cause some imbalance. Matthew chapter 13 and verse uh, 33. So what we read up to this time, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Folks, that's true no matter what the leaven represents. Can I get an amen? Okay, well, let's read 33. Another parable spoke he unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. Now, she's not saying... That the kingdom of heaven is defiled with sin. That's not what she's saying. 
She's saying that everything that Jesus has said up through this time, he, well, he says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. It's like a pearl of great price. It's like seed put into the ground. And that seed is Christ, and we're the ground. So over and over, every time he says the kingdom of heaven is like, he's likening that to treasure being in earth or seed being in ground or a pearl of great price and selling everything to get that pearl. It's always about Christ. It's always about gaining more. Of, it's not just about Christ. It's about an increase of Christ. And leaven is a perfect picture of increase. Can I get an amen? It is a perfect picture of increase. So Jesus, Jesus is the one speaking these words. And um, he says it's like the kingdom. Kingdom. Okay, well, what is the kingdom? Well, you, most of you know my explanation of that, but that's the government of Christ within. The kingdom of heaven is within you. It's not just, uh, I know the scripture says among you, but in the original Greek it means the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is within you. And it's not just... Uh, first and foremost, that he's trying to govern those people out there, folks. He's trying to govern us first. If he can't govern his own people, then he, you know, what's the point? If we can't be governed by Christ, what's the point, you know? And so uh, that's what Jesus is beginning to describe here is the coming of the government of God, government by nature, government by life, government by his nature. Our nature, if we live by our nature, Anybody have a clue what that's going to look like? It's going to be ugly, you know. But if we live by his nature, then that's where the fruit of the Spirit, folks, we're, you know, this Bible doesn't say copy the fruit of the Spirit. It says it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not your fruit. You can't produce it. It's his fruit. He produces it through you. But what, what do most Christians do? They outline on the board the fruit of the Spirit, and they take it one at a time and try to teach the fruit. That, that's like walking up to an apple tree and talking to it about bringing forth apples. Now, here's what you do. Now, here's what you got to do. At the certain stage, you just bring forth leaves and stuff. But at a certain stage, it's real important. You push hard, and apples will come out. You know, Nobody has ever had to preach to a, an apple tree or any other kind of tree to convince it about fruit. It does it automatically at a certain stage of maturity and growth, okay? The fruit of the Spirit, you don't have to teach the fruit of anything, the fruit. If it works, you better teach it because you've got to do it. But he's not teaching it for something you do. It's, he's teaching it for something that he does through you. And so the point is um, this, this government Go, uh, as I say, government by life, government by nature. He, he governs us by his spirit, by his nature, by his life within. And so um, basically when Jesus is talking about the kingdom spreading and spreading in us, then he's talking about letting Jesus' life in. And you know what? It's like this. If you'll let him in just a little but it'll really be his life, his government. See, because we'll let... We'll allow Jesus, uh, many Christians will allow Jesus to be um, their savior from hell. Okay, Jesus is going to save me from hell, so I'm all for that. Okay, Jesus is going to do something in my life. He's going to heal me. I'll allow that. Jesus is going to give me some money. I'll allow that. But when it comes to Jesus governing as his life within us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, then we say, no, no, I want to live my life for God instead of allowing Christ to live his life in us. I want, to, I want to give my all. Well, the place you give your all is at the cross where it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, Christ lives. And he doesn't just say he lives on a throne far away. He lives in me. This is the government of God. This is, you know, most of the parables when he talks about the kingdom, folks, they're not talking about something that's going to happen one day. I, I challenge you to look up the parables. He's not, he never brings up a parable about something that's going to happen after the second coming or well, however you want to term that. He doesn't talk like that. It's always something that happens between the time he said it and whatever you want to call the end. 
It's always this space. It's now. This is where the kingdom, this is where the rule is supposed to come. And if he can't rule in us now, folks, he won't rule over us one day. You understand? Because, you know, there's a, you know, Jesus can sit in, uh, in heaven right now and just be a king and go, okay, Randy, turn left. Stop that. Don't do that. Quit thinking that thought. Go over there and bless that person. Do all that. But that's not doing me any good. That's not, that's, I, I, I'm a robot if that's the case. Right? I'm a parrot. Speak now. Oh, well, well, well. You know, Jesus loves you. Jesus died. To, you know, and I've heard people witness that way. You know, they're like a parrot. They have a, a little thing memorized. Jesus loves you. Jesus died to save you. You know, the Roman road. Get on, you know, and they start quoting, you know. And it's, they're just like a zombie or a parrot or, or a, a whatever, you know. Angels do exactly what God wants, and God didn't satisfy, didn't settle on angels being the answer. Angels cannot have the life of Christ within them. But we can have the very life of, you know, angels are just servants that have wings. We are called sons of God because we have Christ's life within us. We become partakers of the divine nature. Okay. So how many, how many live by the rule of the divine nature, meaning by the life and nature at work in us? How many of us acknowledge that? Well, that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the kingdom being like leaven. And he's saying, not if you'll let me in a little bit in relationship to getting saved from hell, you know, someday. Not if you'll let me in to heal you. You know, you can be, you can be a completely selfish person and get saved, and, and get healed, and get finances. And in fact, your primary purpose for having Jesus in your life is for your selfishness. Did you know that's possible? That there are people that follow Jesus simply for their own ends, simply in a selfish manner. We were talking about that tonight. That, that uh, you know, a lot of people, they don't even think in terms of missions or giving outward or whatever like that because the whole of Christianity is, I'm, I'm going to go to church and this is going to help me have success in my business. This is going to help my family to be a happy home. This is going to help my, you know. Well, I got news. There were people in the Bible who didn't have happy homes and didn't have a lot of that, but they had the Lord. Everything isn't always perfect in the earth, but he's always perfect. Amen? Everything is not always perfect, but he is, and he didn't come. Think of this. What if he didn't come first and foremost to straighten out your family? He came first and foremost to straighten you out. Wow. Yeah. See, he didn't come to straighten out that person on your job. Well, it was. You're the person <laughs> on the job that he wants to straighten out. But, he, he's, not, but he's not in the straightening out business. He's in the... Form God the Father is in the forming of his Son in every believer. That's the kingdom of God. That's when we begin to be ruled by that which is above instead of that which is on the earth. So um, that's why Jesus is likening to this. Look with me in Ephesians, and you begin to catch a glimpse of this. Ephesians, the third chapter. And there's a bunch of this in Ephesians. I'm only picking, uh, <clears throat> I'm only picking one scripture, but I mean it says it over and over and over in Ephesians and also in Colossians, Ephesians chapter three, and verse nineteen. Let's read all the way to the end. Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you what. Let's don't. Let's start at verse twenty. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Okay. Now. How many of you have looked at that scripture and said, now, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that, and you use that in relationship to something that you could get from God. He's able to fix my job or give me money or heal me, or he's able to really, I mean, but look at the context of this scripture. I'm just saying let's stick with the context of the Bible. Let's start with verse 19 into verse 20. And it says, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God now unto him who is able. The, all this ability, all of this uh, exceedingly abundant, all of this uh, 
above what he can ask or think is the ability to fill you with the fullness of God. Not to fill you with more money. Not to fill your purse or billfold. Hold up your billfold. Hold up your purse now and God will fill it. You know? Well, if he does, he's filling a selfish person's billfold or purse for the most part. You understand what I'm saying? You know? And then, well, thank you, Jesus, for this money. And then we go spend it on ourselves. You know? Oh, now I can get that thing I always wanted that I wanted to consume on my lust. You know? And we say, oh, and, but we're real thankful. We give glory to Jesus. Thank you for taking care of my flesh. Thank you for honoring my soul and my flesh. He's not, you know, first of all, that's out of context with this scripture. Does God give you things? Yes. Does God heal you when you don't deserve it? Oh, baby. Yeah, he does. Does he, you know, he does. He's wonderful. There's no question about it. But just because he's wonderful doesn't mean you are. But he is wonderful, and he wants to live in you. So that his, him who is wonderful counselor can come out of you, not just so you can be a better Christian, but Christ can be more in you. You can be filled with all, I mean, come on, think of that concept, filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, I mean, doesn't it sound a whole different ring now when you hear it in context with the Bible? just flowing with the regular word of God. Now you better believe that he can, he can remove everything of you, of your life, of your uh, selfishness, of your, he can fill you with all the fullness of God according to, you know, ab above what you could even ask or think because what you ask is selfish and what you think is selfish. So he's got to do it above that. But he does it according to the power that's at work in us. How much do we let him fill us? Unto him be glory in the church. He didn't say unto him be glory by the church. He says in the church. It's, it's right there, verse 21. We're, you know, so what do we do? We say, okay, the purpose of the church is to give God glory. Now, what do we mean by that? That we stand around going glory, 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 glory. Let's give God glory, 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 glory. You know, a way to give God glory is to let his son live in us and we be the actual body of Christ. In other words, not just like Jews that have a God way up in heaven and, and we ha we've at least chosen the right God. And so we say glory, glory, glory. But rather, we're filled with the fullness of God. We have the life of the son and we're giving the father his son and the glory is not being done by the church, but in the church. Do you see that? Do you see the context? Verse 19 into 20. Verse 20 into 21. And you see, the problem is, is that we've got to learn to read the Bible. And when I say that, I don't just mean read a book. I mean read what it's saying. I mean not take verse 20 and apply it to other things when it doesn't apply there not take verse 21 and assume just because we've been taught a certain thing that we think that the way we give glory to God is simply by standing and going and saying glory, glory, glory. And then reading that into that verse, but unto him be glory in the church. And he's being glorified in his body. And it's not just a group of people that believe in the right God like the Jews. It is a group of people filled with all the fullness of God. Christ in you, as he says in Colossians, the hope of glory. So, um, let's look in uh, Matthew again. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, <coughs> in verse... Ten. This is the Lord's Prayer, commonly known as the Our Father by Catholics. Verse 10, thy kingdom come. This is Jesus. They ask him how to pray, and he says, here's how you pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The more you study 
and you begin to understand by the Spirit the relationship the church has with Jesus as his bride and as his body, as branches to the vine, the more you begin to discover that the kingdom is not some end time event. The kingdom of God you begin to be awakened to the reality that God, that Jesus said, you know, he didn't say now a couple of thousand years is going to pass and then pray this, O oh Lord, bring your kingdom back. That, that's the basic understanding most Christians have. You know, let's wait, let's wait for 2,000 years and then let's pray, O oh Lord, bring your kingdom back. Jesus said, they, said, they looked at Jesus and they said, you pray different than the Pharisees, man. They pray in a completely different way. Teach us to pray. And he says, okay, here's how you pray. Pray just like this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Notice the wording. In earth, not on earth. I'm just pointing out what's in your Bible. I, I didn't sneak in there overnight and rewrite it. He's wanting to do it. Who's the earth? We are. Here's where the earth, here's where he wants his kingdom to come in earth as it is in heaven. The way he, how does he rule in heaven supremely? How does he rule in the church? Well, that's another question, isn't it? He wants his kingdom to come and we be moved from death to life, not just from bad to good. Bad and good are on the same tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So if you move from one side of the tree that is the, has fruit that's evil, and you crawl over the branch and you get to the other side and you find some good, you haven't left the, the tree yet. You're still on the same tree. You, you haven't passed from anything except from one side of the tree to the other. You've still got the same roots, you still got the same problem, and you still got the same God saying, don't eat of that. He says you've passed from death to life. Who's dead? We were dead. Not just, we were not just dead because of sin. We were dead. And Christ is life. And so we pass from our life, which is death, to his life, which is life. So that's why Jesus says, you know, that kingdom come. In other words, He's not just trying to separate heaven from earth. I mean, that's, that's kind of a basic concept that people have. Well, Jesus is just like trying to save people out of the earth. Well, that, there's a certain truth to that. But the truth is, he didn't just come to separate it. If he just wanted to separate it, then nobody would be saved. He came to be formed in us, that his rule, that his nature would come in earth in us not just for us but in us and that's why that's why the scripture said in Ephesians that he might be glorified in the church look over in the gospel of John this is in my opinion just such a great in chapter 3 it's such a great scripture that helps us to understand what Jesus said when he said the kingdom of heaven is like leaven John chapter 3 and verse 30. John says this, He must increase, but I must decrease. Does that sound like the kingdom being like leaven, where he said you hide it in three measures of meal, and before too long it fills up the whole thing? Here in these verses you have an increase and a decrease. You have, you have the leaven of his government taking over. More of Jesus, less of me. More of Jesus, less of me. More of Jesus, less of me. You have God bringing forth his son. And this is, this is clearly a scripture. And, you know, the interesting thing about this is John, when he talked about this, he wasn't talking about when he said he must increase and I must decrease. He wasn't even talking about sin in his life. You know what he was talking about? All that he did for God.
That's what he was talking about. All that he did for God must decrease and Christ must increase. So, you know, the example, they came to John and they said, John, what's the deal, man? You know, Jesus and his disciples are now baptizing more than you and your, your name is the Baptist, you know? How come they're doing more than you are? And John said, have you never really got my message? I'm not him. He's coming. There's one greater than me. I'm not worthy. Everything that he said was pointing to, to one who was going to come and be the fulfillment of all that God ever wanted. Well, he comes in his body. He comes in us. And he is the fulfillment of all that God ever wanted. Amen? So John says, so they say, well, you know, it looks like, it looks to me like, John, your ministry is decreasing and Jesus' ministry is increasing. And don't you feel a little bad about this? Don't you, you know, aren't you a little upset? And he said, no, this was the plan all along. He must increase. I must decrease. You see? Well, how many Christians even think that way? How many Christians even think, I'm working, my ministry, I am working toward the day where it's all Christ coming through me and none of me. Not my good ideas, not my ambitions, not my, even if my ambitions are for the Lord, that's still my life. It's still my fruit instead of his fruit. Not, not I, Paul said in Galatians 2.20. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. I am crucified with Christ. Now that's somebody that the kingdom has just totally taken him over. Not I, but Christ lives in me. See, John's talking about ministry. Paul's talking about just flat out living every day in anything, whether it's ministry or not. John says he must increase. I, I want less of me in my ministry. I want less of my ideas. I want less of my plans. I want less of my ability. And they're going, and, and, and these other ministers are coming up to John and going, dude, you're going to have some real problems here if you keep decreasing. I mean, God's not, you know, I mean, how are people going to bless your ministry if you don't promote yourself? Well, how'd they bless Jesus? Jesus made himself of no reputation. And he's world famous. If you'll allow me to say it like that, you know. But you see, we think, no, it's got to be taken in hand. I mean, I've got to do this. I've got to promote. I've got to get out there. I've got to get my, you know, I've got to do all this stuff. Well, you know, if the Lord leads you to somebody or whatever, that's a different story. But John is seeing that this is exactly what the work of leaven is in me. He's taken over in me. My God. He's moving and taking over, and Paul, and Paul saw it even more sharply than that. Like I said with uh, Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I, let's put the word I up here on the cross, you know. I am crucified. Christ lives. Okay. Well, I don't know if you folks remember when I was teaching in... Uh, uh, Brazil down there, but <coughs> but uh, they have this saying in uh, all throughout all the Latin countries. All you got to do is yell out real loud, "Quien vive?" That means who lives, and everybody will go Cristo, and you go "Quien vive?" Cristo, "Quien vive?" And you, you know, I mean, you can get them so you know hyped up and riled up, they'll bite the back out of the chair in front of them, man. <laughs> well. So I changed that, and I said to them, I said, okay, Kim Bebe, and they said, Jesus lives. And I said, now what, what good is that if Jesus lives and you're still down here in the earth with your problems and everything? Well, it's a good thing he lives, but I'm miserable. So I said, Kim Bebe, Cristo, and I said, donde vive? He lives in me. He always lived in heaven, folks. The new covenant is not that he's up in heaven. That, that's old news. This is good news we're talking about here. The good news is he lives in me. And so then now I go, Kim Bibi, Cristo, donde vive? In nosotros. In us. Christ lived. Paul said, I am crucified. I, the eye of me is crucified. 
Nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ lives, oh, but there's, it's greater than that. Christ lives in me. That's the, the point of leaven isn't, you know, Jesus didn't say the kingdom of heaven is like a big throne with a big old lump of leaven on it. And it's cool. I mean, it's the neatest bunch of leaven you ever saw. Oh, yeah, you know, we're all down here messed up and everything, but at least he's okay. No, it's in three measures of meal. It's in us. It's in us. And that's how, you know, that's how you make bread, by the way. I used to make it from scratch when I was raised in the orphanage. And I remember how you add in the leaven and you do all this stuff. You add in the yeast. The whole point of this, is, the whole point of the new covenant, folks, is what God now is in, in his people, not just with his people, not just Judaism, not just what, what his people have of a God that will do miracles. The, the, the greatness of the new covenant, folks, wasn't that God does miracles. God always did miracles. The Jews, you know, they say, you know, somebody's healed, somebody's done this, and the Jews could say, well, you know, Elijah, Moses, all these guys, they did healings. They did miracles. People were even raised from the dead in the Old Covenant. That wasn't new. I mean, we're Gentiles. So, well, you're Gentiles, but, you know, but, you know, and so you think that that, that is, uh, that was it. I mean, like, all of a sudden, that started everything, and that was great. For the Jews, that was already, they already had that down. They wanted something new. They already knew God would do miracles for them. They already knew God could change their finances or help them or feed them or do stuff like that. God gave us manna from heaven for 40 years, they said. And Jesus said, I've got something better than a miracle. I am the bread of life. Eat me and you'll live by me. Put me on the inside of you and let me enter into your system so that it is my life. That's the new covenant. Not just that he can shower manna on us or do those kind of things. So here when he's saying this, he's, he's looking at this thing like, you know, well, let's put it this way. So we're looking at it like, okay, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. One day the kingdom of heaven is going to come. Now he said the kingdom of, God, of heaven is in your midst. He said it's at hand. When Jesus first started praying, he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Didn't he? Now, now you tell me this. Did he mean now it's, you know, it's really going to be 2,000 more years? But that's close for me because I'm God. I mean, do you think that's really what he's, you know, he's going, he's going, okay, I'm the answer. I've come, but nothing is really, really going to change for another couple of thousand years. <laughs> you know, he said it's at hand right here, and then he said it's in the midst of you or it is within you. And that is... The chain, so, how, so what do we believe the answer is? We believe one day God is just going to break out with miracles and healings and everything, and it's going to spread around the world with wildfire. He said, here's, how, here's, how, here's my chosen method of spreading the kingdom. I'm going to put it in you like leaven, and it's going to just start taking over on the inside of you. I'm going to do it person by person putting my son in there, and he's going to increase, and you're going to decrease, and your eye is going to die, and my son is going to live in you. And that's how I'm going to change the world. Because he already had people that could run around and do miracles, even in the Old Testament. And Jesus said, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it'll bring forth much fruit. And he says, because they had seen so many miracles, yet they believed not in him. This is John, the Gospel of John, chapter 12. This is saying that they've seen the miracles, and they're still, you know, okay, imagine, imagine a, a, um, a tree that's got rotten roots and rotten veins, and it's full of, and everything that it brings forth is bad apples and bad junk, okay? Now imagine it watching, you know, sitting in a church service, watching somebody get healed. 
Then it jumps up and goes, oh, they got it. Oh, that's wonderful. But did it change them? No. It made them happy for a minute. So Jesus is seeing this while he's doing all these miracles, and he's going, you know, this is not the answer. If you're going to be changed, you're going to have to be changed into my life. And he said, he said, except a corn of wheat, except a seed. So imagine there being one seed, only one, and that's Jesus. One seed of this particular nature. Right? Man had a completely different nature, and when they brought forth, they brought forth after Adam. They brought forth after the nature of Adam. This seed brings forth after the nature of God. And he said... For this seed, to br- ha- for me to get more of this, this is going to have to fall down into the ground and die. And then when the comes up, then on that tree will be seeds just like it. Now imagine if somebody discovered in one of the tombs in Egypt one seed of something that they ha- you haven't seen for 6,000, 4,000 years. Oh, my God. And they examine and they go, there's nothing like this. This is the only seed like this. And not only that, this is the seed that was written about by people way back when, that when you plant it, it it could feed the whole world. This, This is the answer to abundance, abundant life, abundance of life. What are, you know... And so, so the professor who finds it goes, my God, this is wonderful. <laughs> he goes, man, that was good. Whoopee. But what about everybody else? <laughs> you see, they say, you know what? For this seed to have any effect on us today, we're going to have to lose it. We're going to have to put it in the ground, and it's going to have to die to itself in this form and become in a many-membered form. In other words, the original seed nature in every new seed, Christ in you. See? Is that a good plan? Well, it is a good plan. But it's not the same as, you know, it'd be like a farmer going out to his field and he plows it and everything and he doesn't really put any seed in the ground and he walks out there and he says, okay. And he calls all the other farmers around and he says, okay, I'm believing God for a miracle. I want to, I've got, you know, I've got, in Texas we got a lot of acreage. So, you know, I've got 10,000 acres here, you know, which is nothing for Texas. You know, I've got 10,000 acres here, you know. And you fellow farmers, get over here. Believe with me that God will do a miracle and a harvest will come in. Let's just believe. Oh, Lord, bring forth a harvest. One of the, you know, the old farmer, the real old one stands there and goes, excuse me, son. He goes, well, yeah, yeah. excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, just calm down for a second. Well, I'm believing God. I know, and I just want to ask you a question. Did you plant any seed? No, I'm believing for a miracle. You know, that old farmer would say, you sure are. (laughs) Boy, that's a fact. You know, because we're thinking it's going to be a miracle without the seed. And Galatians 3.16 says the seed is Christ. And the seed is supposed to be reproduced in every one of us so that it's Christ in every one of us. And that's how he wants to bring forth a harvest and change the world, but we're standing there looking at the barren fields going, oh, I don't care, I don't go by what I see. I'm believing God that, well, you can, you know, and God's good, he might have, a, he might have something spring up in one corner, but it is not his way of changing the world. I believe in miracles. I love miracles. We just had one last Sunday. And I'm so happy for the person that, I I love to see the Lord move like that. But I tell you what, God did a bigger miracle in that girl than the healing he did. He spent four years of dealing with her about Christ as her life and got the seed in her. And then he says, well, man, this is no longer an issue anymore. 
You know, I got what I was after, Christ. So, you know, here, be healed. But just randomly healing flesh people so that they can live more selfishly is not his goal. And not everybody does that, but a lot of people do. So, you know, it's his method of, you know, his method is, Jesus said in John 15, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. If you want to bring forth fruit, abide in me and let my life come into your branch, and I'll bring forth fruit through you. Is that what he said or not? That's what he said. Okay. So, what do we do? We ignore the life of Christ in us. We don't work on he must increase and I must decrease. We work on, we fast and pray. Oh, Lord, I'm going to fast and pray more of your life. But we're not asking for more of his life. We're asking for more love, more joy, more peace, more gentleness, more meekness. And yet that comes forth. That's, that's the fruit of his life. But we're praying, oh, make me more loving. And he's going, no, I want you I have a place for you. It's called the cross. I want you to be crucified, and I want Christ to live in you. And I have broke you off of your old life. I've cut you out of your old life, and I've grafted you into my son so that his life will start rushing through you. And, that, you know, I mean, that would be confusing. Uh, I, when I was a missionary in Jamaica, we did grafting and stuff. That would be confusing if you if you took... A, a branch and you put it in a good vine and that one branch kept bringing forth the fruit of the old old you know for example if you had a, 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 a wonderful grape vine and it just brought forth delicious grapes and you took a branch out of a sour lemon tree and you grafted it into that grape vine and it started bringing forth sour lemons. You'd go, well, this didn't do any good. But you see, if it catches, what does it mean to abide? To abide means to stay plugged into him until what's him, what is not just in him, what's him, the life of the vine starts filling and becoming the life of of the branch. Does that make sense to anybody? The life of the vine becomes the life of the branch, and then it won't, it, it'll bring forth out of his spirit and out of his nature. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to push yourself, you know. The, f the, the first cause is the seed. The first cause is the vine. I'm the true vine. Any, anything else that you plug into, he's saying, that's basically what he's saying. I'm the true vine. As a branch, anything you el else you plug into and bring forth is not true. But it's, it's good, but it's not God. You know, we're trying to become more godly without God, <laughs> other than God helping us. Well, that would mean we become God-like. Well, we don't. We're not God. Jesus is God. But Jesus is supposed to live in us. And we're supposed to live by the divine nature, the scriptures declare. All right, look with me over in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 and verse 14 and 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. <clears throat> All right. Now, you can say that this is saying, for as many as are led by the Holy Spirit. But I want you to notice the context. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
the emphasis here is on what this spirit produces. This is, and I'm not going to go there, but in Galatians it describes it perfectly. It says, because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit. It says the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Are you familiar with the scriptures that says that? He sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart. And now you cry, Father, by Christ. You are a son of God by Christ, not by works, not by choice of religion, but by Christ. So if you go through a spirit of fear and bondage, that's us. We're the ones that get into fear. We're the ones that get into bondage. Does the son within us, the one that's crying, Father, Father, is, does he get into bondage? Is he, is he all freaked out? You know what? I don't know what I'm going to do. You know? he gets in a bad situation you know and jesus was in plenty of bad situations but he's in you and so you get in a bad situation does jesus you know you go well jesus you're my life what are we going to do in this situation he goes i don't know i mean this looks bad to me you know well normally what we do is we look up to heaven we look up to heaven and we say well lord help me out of this but he said i've sent forth the spirit of my son into your heart I want him living in you. I want my kingdom to come. It's like you're living on the earth down here, but you, you're still in the Jewish realm waiting for the kingdom to come. And I'm telling you, the king, because where is the kingdom? Anywhere the king reigns. That's the kingdom. What's the kingdom of God? It's anywhere the king reigns. Is he reigning in you? Living in you? Not just living beside you, I am sitting beside Jesus, but Jesus lives in me, and I live, and I cause him problems. Is that Galatians 2.20? I am not crucified with Christ. I just live, but Christ lives in me, and I am a constant frustration to him. You know what I just described right there? Christianity for the most part. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but Paul had a different view of what Christianity was meant to be. He, meant, he saw it as Christ living in us, but that wasn't all. Because every Christian, well, most every Christian will claim that. He saw it as I am crucified and Christ is the government of my life. Because anywhere Christ governs, that's the kingdom of God. So I, it's not my mind. I have the mind of Christ. I mean, the scriptures say that, for we have the mind of Christ. Has anybody ever read that scripture that says, for we have the mind of Christ, and said, we do? <laughs> you know, and thought, well, I don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, have you, ever, have you ever thought that? Well, that's a little bit like a branch who is, who is tied on, because to graft a branch into a vine, you have to tie it on for a while until it catches. It's tied on to the vine, but it hadn't caught. So he says, we have the mind of Christ. We go, well, I don't think so. I mean, you ought to see what goes off in my mind. But the vine life has a mind. It's the mind of Christ because it is Christ. And it's flowing through all of his branches, but this one hadn't caught. But I'm at least tied into Jesus. You know, I'm united with Jesus. But are you one? No, I'm not one yet. I'm just sort of connected by what? By stuff that if you shake it too hard, I will fall away and cry, you know, <laughs> or whatever, whatever people think, you know. And there, it, there's the fear of bondage and whatever. But he said, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. This is talking about the glorious liberty of the sons of God. I mean, look at verse 21, because the creation itself also 
shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now notice this, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. If you're going to fully get that, you've got to drop all the way down to verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of of his son. What is the glorious liberty of the sons of God? What is it that will free us from the corruption of this creation? Christ in you, the kingdom coming in earth as it is in heaven, leaven filling us up until he's totally taken over. I don't know if I even read the one in Ephesians that he said that he might fill. I didn't emphasize that he might fill all things, that he might fill all things. See, think of that. If that's the plan of God, the plan of God is that Jesus come and fill all things. So what does he do? He fills an earthen vessel, and he's the treasure. He fills a branch, and he's the vine. He fills the body, and he's the life of the body. Every one of those are actual living relationships whereby Christ is living in us. To fill us isn't just, you know, isn't just to fill, you know, it's like a, a vacuum. We're a vacuum, and he fills everything around it. He fills the airways with Christian songs, and he, he fills, but we're still devoid. You know, the Christian songs are more Christian than we are. You understand what I mean? And we're like Saul, we're like Saul uh, in the Old Testament, King Saul, who he's demon-infested and everything, but, but David comes, and David's got the Lord, David's got the Lord on the inside. And, and in fact, one of the scriptures we'll get into eventually is that, you know, David said, I, when I awake, I want to awake in your likeness. I, well, that's not talking about someday when he dies. He's talking about waking up. And we'll get into all that. We'll get into all that. We'll, we'll see what that means. Because Paul was saying to the church, wake up, you know. And so just this reality where Christ begins to fill all things, well, folks, the first thing he ought to be able to fill is his own body, you know. I mean, that'd be like a whole, that would be like my body, okay? Imagine, have you ever read about, seen in a movie, or known somebody that was schizophrenic? Okay. And if you ever knew somebody like that, you didn't know who you were going to talk to at any given time, you know. I mean, you know, it could be a girl, and then you meet Bob, you know. And, and then, you know, Susie's real quiet, and Janet's, ah, you, know, I'm a, you know. Basically, the problem there is you got a whole bunch living in one person. God made it where one body ought to have one person in it. Can I get amen? amen. Well, what person ought to be living in the body of Christ? But it's like he's got all these little people in there, and they go, oh, no, I want to go this way. No, I want this. Oh, I don't believe in that. Well, I believe in this. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. and the head, and, you know. <laughs> you know. Jesus isn't supposed to be schizophrenic, but his body is full of. <laughs> and he's not, but his body is full of junk because we brought it in. You know. I mean, it's like, it'd be like my wife going off to a thrift store and coming back home and my living room just lined with stuff when I come home. <laughs> it's like that right now. <laughs> you can't get in the house. You know, what's all this? You know, if, if my daughter was standing there, I'd say, what's all this? And she says, well, your wife brought it in. You know, you know, it'd be different if she said, well, a burglar broke in and put all this in your house. You know what I mean? Well, you just, but your wife is bringing it in. <laughs> well, we're the bride of Christ. Can I get amen? amen? And we're bringing in all kind of stuff. How, does, how do you empty the house? How do you empty the body that only Christ lives? The cross. 
I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me. It's Christ that's living in me. Amen? God. All right, well, we're rolling now, so it's time to stop. <laughs> Let's take a break, and we'll come back in about 10 minutes.